I'd like to welcome like everyone to this. To the, I'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar, Risk and Regulation, What Does It Mean for the Supply Chain? This webinar is hosted in association with construction law specialist Fennec Elliott and fire engineering consultancy OFR Consultants. I am Thomas Lane, the technical editor of Building Magazine. This is the second in our series of risk and regulation webinars. The first looked at the wider industry response to the government's proposals for a reformed building safety regime that followed on from the Hackett Review. Today, we will be looking in more detail at the implications of the government proposals on the supply chain, who are working on residential buildings over 80 meters high. This includes the duties that will be placed on designers and contractors on how their roles are likely to change in the future and the new competence framework that will apply to everyone involved in the design and construction of buildings that are covered by the new legislation. So today I'm joined by a panel of six experts. Graham Watts, who is the Chief Executive of the Construction Industry Council and the Chair of the Competence Steering Group. David Fries, who is a Group Ch Chief Executive Officer of the Building Engineering Services Association. Julie Bregula, who is the Technical Director of Assurance at BRE Group. Simon Lay, who is the Director at OFR Consultants. John Miller, who is a partner at Fennec Elliott. And finally, David Stowe, who is an Associate Director of Fire Engineering at Arrow. So the way that today is going to work is that each presenter will talk for about 10 minutes. And once the presentations are over, we'll take questions from the audience. So this is a message to everyone out there who's listening. You can submit your questions during the presentations, but also afterwards as well. So if you want to get your question in early, I recommend doing it during the presentations. So um, I'm now going to hand over to Graham Watts, who is going to um, present. So thank you very much, Graham. I can hand over to you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, can I just check that you can hear me OK? I can, yes. Fantastic. I hope everybody else can hear me. Um, First of all, apologies, because although um, I hope you can hear me, uh, you can't unfortunately see me uh, because we had some uh, technical difficulties and I'm joining you by a mobile phone and uh, you can hear me, but you can't see me. And, uh, and I all got dressed up for the occasion as well with a, a shirt and tie and waistcoat, but never mind, you just have to imagine that. Um, I'm very happy to be back speaking to this conference. I think this is the third time uh, that I've had the pleasure and the honour of speaking uh, to the conference. And I'd like to start, actually, by congratulating uh, the organisers on their splendid and rather superb timing, because we are one day before the government is expected to unveil uh, the Building Safety Bill, and we are one day after the publication of the Future of Building Control Report, and just a few weeks ahead of the publication of Setting the Bar, which is to be the final report in response to Dame Judith Hackett's call for improved competence throughout the industry. And these are all interrelated. And I plan to speak about all of them as briefly as possible. Um, I, I don't quite know how I'm gonna get through 20 slides in 10 minutes, but I'll do my best. Um, as Thomas has said, I, as well as being the Chief Executive of the Construction Industry Council, I'm also a member of the Industry Response Group, which has been liaising with MHCLG over the drafting of the bill. Uh, I'm a member of the Future of Building Control Group and uh, chair of the Competence Steering Group that is responsible for the recommendations to improve competencies across the industry. So I hope to be able to give you some necessarily brief insights into the interrelation of these various important activities and how they're going to impact on risk and regulation. Uh, can we move on to slide two, please? There we I are. Uh, is it there? Because I can still only see slide one. Yeah, oh, I've got it. Okay. Right. I entitled my presentation "A Whole New Ball Game: 
And that was because the building industry is in for a game changer in terms of risk and regulation, which is at least as significant as the introduction of VAR has been in football. Instead of VAR, we're going to have the BSR. And instead of a referee, we're going to have a regulator, the building safety regulator. Uh, can you move on to slide three? And just like uh, VAR, the BSR will have its host. But instead of this being Stockley Park, the building safety regulator will be located within the health and safety executive. And also, just as VAR has begun with the Premier League, the BSR is also starting off at the elite end of higher risk buildings in terms of height and their risk to life safety. And again, the similarity continues in that if it works well, then it will spread to other buildings, just as VAR is likely to spread to the lower football leagues. Anyone who knows football will know that VAR has not been without its controversy. Uh, and I suspect that the BSR will also not commence life without plenty of difficulties. But we all want buildings to be safer, and we all want residents to feel safer inside them. And we have a broken system that must be changed. Can you move on again? Next slide, please. We know that there will be a building safety bill because it was announced in the Queen's speech. In fact, unusually, it was announced twice on the 14th of October and then again after the general election on the 19th of December. And as I said earlier, we expect the MHCLG Secretary of State's announcement tomorrow and it will accompany publication of the draft bill. Crucially, the draft building safety bill will be subject to pre-legislative scrutiny over the summer. And that's a really important time for all of us to help and make sure we avoid those controversies by getting what is on the face of the bill right first time. This is likely to lead uh, to amendments before the bill is presented to Parliament in the autumn. And the current forward plan is for the bill to receive royal assent in 2021. However, and it is quite a big however, it's bound to be subject to secondary legislation, which I expect will have most of the operational detail, and transitional arrangements. And this is very important. I'll say a bit more about that later. Uh, could you move on to slide five, please? It's important to say that we are really Still, three years after the Grenfell tragedy, only at a very early stage in this pathway to change. We've obviously had the Hackett Review, Building a Safer Future. We've had the MHCLG's implementation plan following that review. And we've had a public consultation and the government's response to that, which was published in April. As I said before, we expect the draft bill tomorrow, or at least if there's a slip up, prior to the summer parliamentary recess. Then there will be this period of pre-legislative scrutiny over the summer, a report to ministers on the outcome of that scrutiny, the government's response, and then the bill finally going into parliament sometime before Christmas, I believe. After parliamentary scrutiny, it will become an act probably somewhere before the summer of next year, but then there's still a lot more work to be done. The secondary legislation will include all the details so that it can be much more so that it can be more easily amendable if it needs to be, and there will need to be these transitional arrangements before implementation. My best guess is that we won't see this implementable in law until 2024. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be saying that if I were a civil servant, but it does seem to me, looking at it from the outside, uh, to be the most realistic scenario. Uh, could you move on to the next slide, please? The bill is likely to be complex. It, it's certainly going to have many clauses since it is setting out a new regulatory regime. It will need to dovetail with other legislation, such as the fire safety order, and it may need, it's likely to need, I think, to repeal parts of existing legislation, such as the Building Act 1984. It will need to define powers and responsibilities of the building safety regulator, of the accountable persons, the duty holders, and the gateways. And I'm going to say a bit more about each of these in a few minutes. But as I said before, it's not likely to cover detail, which will be in secondary legislation 
that we're not likely to see uh, until at least the end of next year or the beginning of the year after. Uh, could you move on to the next slide, please? The bill creates a series of new duty holders to ensure accountability for issues relating to fire and structural safety. During design, construction and refurbishment, these will be the client, the principal designer, the principal contractor, other designers and other contractors. And during occupation, uh, it will be the accountable person and the building safety manager. So in essence, seven new duty holders will be created uh, by uh, the, the bill. The accountable person, just to avoid any uh, doubt on this, is almost certain to be a duty holder in the new regime. The registration system will require that the person responsible for building safety comes forward and identifies themselves as the accountable person who will then be responsible for the safety of the building and they will have a range of enforceable safety obligations. The accountable person will have a duty to appoint a building safety manager who will have operational responsibility for uh, issues relating to fire and life safety within a building that is in scope to the new legislation. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Gateways are the new regulatory points during the design and construction phases of development that align with the existing planning and building control regimes, but introducing much more stringent requirements for the buildings in scope to the new legislation. Gateway one will occur before planning permission is granted, gateway two before construction begins, and gateway three before the building's occupation. It's quite important to note that gateway one will have to slot into the existing established planning system in England. And so it's likely to be delivered by a secondary legislation. I don't think we will see anything about gateway one uh, in particular on the face of the building safety bill. The building safety bill will provide powers to introduce gateways two and three at which named duty holders must demonstrate to the building safety regulator that they are appropriately considering and managing building safety risks through the design and construction phase, and that the proposals can meet building regulations requirements. Developers must satisfy the building safety regulator of this prior to construction commencing before they're permitted to continue to the next stage of development, and there will be greater regulatory oversight during the construction phase. Uh, could you move on to the next slide? I think it's quite important to read this. So I'm going to, I'm going to read it in case you, you can't, haven't got time to read it. Duty holders will need to ensure that those they employ have the necessary competence to discharge their functions effectively and assure that they themselves are suitably competent for the work they have been engaged to do. This is not from the bill, because I haven't seen the bill, but it's taken from the government response to the Building a Safer Future consultation published in April. And I strongly expect that it will be a part of the legislation uh, to require that engaging people with the appropriate competence will be a necessary part of the gateway approval process. Uh, could you move on to the next slide? Immediately after the Grenfell tragedy, uh, the government and the industry set up the industry response group, the members of which are, are on this slide. The industry, the construction industry, is represented by CIC, my organisation, the Construction Product Association representing um, product manufacturers and distributors, and Build UK representing the construction supply chain. The IRG has been supporting government over the last three years on many, many life safety issues, far too many for me to go into in this presentation. Um, but they include, for example, the current remediation programs to remove unsafe materials from residential towers. And one of the things the IRG did very early on was to set up the competence steering group to oversee the necessary uplift in competencies. Can you move on to the next slide? The CSG has had 45 meetings over the last two years, and it's set up 13 working groups. Altogether, 
It engages over 250 industry organizations from the construction industry, from the fire safety sector, and from client and residence organizations. It also has engaged several government departments, including particularly the MHCLG, uh, the Home Office, and the Health and Safety Executive. The approach of the construction uh, of the competence steering group has been twofold. Firstly, to establish the role and remit of an overarching competence body. We might describe that as a top-down approach. And then, linked by an overarching competence framework to enhance occupational competence frameworks across all sectors that are key to fire and structural safety in high-rise buildings. We might describe that as the bottom-up approach. Can you move on to the, the, the next slide, please? The top-down approach uh, is a new suite of standards, and work has already started at the BSI on this new suite for the principal designer, the principal contractor, and the building safety manager. Further standards, I think, will be developed for other designers and other contractors, and maybe even for the new uh, building control profession. Can you move on to the next slide? Working with MHCLG and the Competence Steering Group, the BSI's objectives are to develop an overarching competence framework to support the proposed new regulation and the wider sector, to establish and agree the competence requirements for the three new roles uh, that are to be regulated, i.e. the principal designer, principal contractor, and building safety manager, and to develop three sets of standardized documents for the competence of these three new regulated roles. Can you move on to the next slide? The outcomes of this work will be a new national standards work stream for competence in the built environment, including a new BSI technical committee, uh, BSI NSB, uh, a new British standards benchmark competence framework, and three PADS publicly available standard specifications for the competence of those three new regulated roles and all the necessary guidance and supporting documents to underpin those new standards. Can you move on to the next slide? This is uh, quite a busy slide, but what it in effect is doing is showing the timeline for this work. It's already started, as I've said. The first draft of these standards should be available in September, and it will be subject to open access public consultation. This will lead to the final iteration uh, of a draft that is due to be ready in March 2021, and again is to be subject to open access public consultation. And if all goes well, the completed standards are due to be published in March uh, 2022 in good time uh, for the legislation to be implemented, as I mentioned before. Can you move on to the next slide? Sorry, can you move on to the next slide? Ah, thank you. Right, the bottom-up approach uh, is the approach of the working group setting enhanced competence standards for uh, a number of um, uh, so I think I might have jumped two slides there, actually. Do you think you can go back one? Yeah, uh, that's right. So the bottom-up approach sets enhanced competence standards for a number of occupational sectors. I'm not going to read them out in the interest of time, uh, but you can see for yourself uh, 12 uh, sets of new occupational standards that are all being knitted together into an overarching competence framework. Uh, the working groups working on this have been beavering away for the past two years developing these frameworks. Now we can go to the next slide. We published our interim report, hopefully many of you will have read it, entitled Raising the Bar uh, back last August. And we had a number of consultative conferences uh, shortly afterwards. The final report, which is to be called Setting the Bar, is due to be published next month. And there'll be an, a, an additional extra because it will also be published alongside another report entitled Safer People, Safer Homes, which is to be the blueprint for the new building safety manager profession. Can you move on to the next slide? Moving quickly on to the last part of this triumvirate, and I've only got one slide on this, the future of building control report 
uh, was published yesterday. It contains new proposals for the regulation of the building control profession. Uh, and a group comprising the eight organizations listed here was invited by the MHCLG to prepare proposals which dovetail with legislation and essentially create a new regulated and unified building control profession. You can move on to the next slide. Oh, I lied about only having one slide, I got two. Uh, the key recommendations, there are 11 recommendations altogether, are to simplify and unify the building control uh, legislation process and procedures, and most importantly, to create an independent designated body to oversee professional registration and organizational audit for all the building control profession, whether it's in the public or the private sector. And this will include a new competence framework, as I've already spoken, uh, working group six of the competence steering group has covered that, a unified code of conduct and a unified career structure. Uh, and can you move on to the next slide, which is the last slide? I'm just gonna conclude with some questions because I think it will help just to pretend, and not to pretend that all is rosy in the garden because I think there are a lot of issues that the new legislation and the new regime poses. First of all, are we gonna have enough building safety managers? I think we need to bear in mind that we're creating a new profession. There's nobody out there at the moment with any kind of standard competencies to act as a building safety manager. And to have built enough building safety managers in place uh, for every building that's gonna be in scope, is gonna be a tall order even for 2024. Um, Secondly, will a new building safety regulator and building control regime be able to cope with the new regime? That's another big question, particularly in terms of capacity. In terms of business model, will the new levels of accountability be insurable? I think many of the people on this webinar will be aware of the current problems with the professional indemnity insurance market, both in terms of a legacy of claims and in terms of new business these new levels of accountability are gonna ratchet up uh, risk. And will the new laws become a block on development? That has to be a big issue for government. And is the scope sufficient at the other end of the telescope? What about other life safety issues? Are we focusing on fire and structural safety uh, at the expense of leaving aside other things which are just as dangerous? Uh, onto the last slide, please. And just to say thank you, uh, sorry, it was a very rapid tour de force covering a lot of ground, and I'm sure I've gone over my time, uh, but thank you very much for listening, and uh, I look forward to the other presentations. Well, th thanks very much indeed, Graham. That was a really interesting um, presentation. And um, I know we do need to move on, but I, I can't resist asking you one quick question about the timetable um, um, really from, I guess, from today at, uh, and the building, the draft building safety bill being published and its implementation and maybe in 2024. I mean, it's two, two strands to this. I mean, firstly, do you see the draft build as being very different from the, the government response to the um, Hackett review? And secondly, do you see, see much, so I guess, horse trading sort of um, and changes to the legislation as it goes through Parliament, the secondary legislation, the transitional arrangements, and I mean, in short, from your experience of dealing with, it, with, with the government officials, how clear, close do you see the final legislation that we will have to comply with? To how close will that be to the where we are now in terms of the recommendations that have come out of government? Uh, well, to be fair to the policy people within MHCLG. Um, they have been pretty consistent in the line from accepting all the Hackett recommendations through to the report on the consultation. And so far as uh, I can see, they are trying to make sure that the legislation carries that forward. I suspect there's been a fair amount of horse trading between the policy people and the legal people within MHCLG. And I think the industry's worry, actually, uh, is that if anything, the primary and secondary legislation may be a little diluted from what we have been expecting. I mean, one of the big issues that my members are concerned about is that there is enough teeth in the legislation to make sure um, that it's not possible to undercut the people are doing the things that they're expected to do. So um, I mean, obviously we'll see for ourselves, um, hopefully tomorrow, 
what the bill is actually going to say. In terms of its parliamentary progress, well, the, the government has a very big majority, um, and I expect that if there are any uh, any areas where there might be some tinkering around with the bill, it will probably come in the Lords, where there are a number of Lords with experience of the property sector and the industry. Right, well, that's really interesting. Well, thanks very much indeed, Graham. Um, so we now need to move on to our next presentation, um, which is going to be presented by David Fries, who is the Group Chief Executive Officer of the Building Services Association. So thank you very much, David. Thank you, Thomas. Can I just confirm you can see my screen? I, I can see the screen, yeah. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Graham. That was very informative. Uh, it was almost as if we'd practiced this because I think you set me up uh, for, for what I'm going to say. So, first of all, uh, I'm David Fries. I'm the Chief Executive of FISA. Uh, and we are uh, the organization that represents, if I can get the next slide to move. Can you see the next slide? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, yeah. you can now. So, these are some of our members. Hopefully, you recognize some of these uh, brands, uh, but mainly the uh, major M&E contractors, some manufacturers, uh, and suppliers. And we're about a thousand members. So, uh, very much the contractors, the doers in the industry. And as a group, uh, we have uh, several other recognizable brands, such as Refcom, which is the FGAS directory. Um, sorry, D D David, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't think we can see your. I mean, people are being told that we can't see your screen. Um, okay. Um, I'm not uh, quite sure why. Uh, let me just check here. I cannot see either. Why not? I shall come out of it. Hmm. No, I don't understand. Why I, I'm, not. I'm not quite. I'm not quite clear why. Um, I'm sorry about this, everybody. Um, That's all right. How is, is, can you see it now? I, I mean, it looks like it should be better. It's, the screen has changed, and um, maybe we can try continuing from there. Okay, if there's a problem, let me know. Okay, uh, thank you. We also uh, look after a number of... So, you can still see my primary screen, is that correct? Yeah, I, I think it needs to be maximised. I think it's rather small. You, you're, you need to sort of maximise your presentation in, on your computer. That is what I'm trying to do. Let's try it down here. How is that? At the bottom, there's a little on the at the bottom panel, you'll see a little kind of book. I think if you press that, you'll get the whole thing. No. I'm not quite clear why it's um I mean, maybe we should just proceed, if you go back to how it was before, so it's going to be a little bit small, but um, if it's still visible, um, because I think we kind of need to keep moving. Yeah, indeed. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Let me try one more thing. No. Yeah, if you, if you go back to how it was, you, you briefly went into your... Um, we could see your screen, although it was minimised, but we could still see it. If you could go back to that and I think then press on from there. That's what I'm trying to get to. My apologies. Has that changed? Not on my end, no, it looks just the same. Okay. Uh, then I can That's do it, it without. That's great. Yeah, if you've you got just it carry now, on from, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay. so uh, some of these recognisable brands. So let me just uh, continue on with that. So uh, Graham was talking before about uh, how we got here and the Grenfell inquiry was something that is uh, certainly something we have taken a lot of account of and the Hackett review that followed that. Uh, and for anybody who has an interest in this area, I would really recommend that they 
uh, watch the Radio 4 podcast or listen to the Radio 4 podcast on the Grenfell Inquiry. Uh, and we firmly believe that if, if it isn't government legislation that will drive this, then insurers certainly will, uh, and clients will, and certainly any clients who listen to the Grenfell Inquiry won't want to go through that process. But essentially what we're looking at is this notion that we often believe that the client is after a building. And, and quite often it isn't a building that they're after, it's an investment vehicle. And an investment vehicle requires three things. It requires on spec, on time, on budget. But of course, on spec is optional in most cases, provided the building looks like the thing you put in for planning, then there's a very good chance that you'll get away with it. There is almost no consequences of not complying with building regulations. And many of the developers sell on the asset in very quick order, so somebody else picks up the tab. This whole process of an investment vehicle that has this driver for on time, on budget, means that you have incomplete designs, hollow designs. So you've designed the facade, you've designed the outside, but much of the interior is not designed. Uh, and because of that, you end up in a build and design scenario very quickly. And build and design is fairly disastrous. From that point, it's very difficult to recover because you have, uh, you have inefficiencies, ineffectiveness. You are rush and hurry scurry to keep up with that completion date. And that's an inefficient way of building. And it leads to defects, it leads to variations, extensions of time, extensions of cost, which are so frustrating for so many people. In many ways, it's like putting together a puzzle where you don't have the front picture. Eventually, somebody takes out a hammer and smacks the pieces into place, which manifest themselves as defects. And then we think, well, the clerk of works is the person who's going to bail us out here, because if the clerk of works has not seen that, or building control has not seen that, we have in some way got away with it. So we are very much of the business that uh, it's up to the contractor to do this evidence of competence and compliance. And evidence of competence and compliance at an individual level and at a company level. So uh, at Visa, what we have done is ensured that we are making ourselves future-proof for Hackett, or our members are future-proof for Hackett. Uh, and so from here on, it's about what we have done in advance of the legislation coming through. So for some time, we've been running a competent person scheme under BESCA, which allows our members to uh, register uh, for building regs on, on uh, controlled systems. Uh, we've been doing that at a loss for many years, and it's misnamed actually as a competent person scheme because it's about the competence of the company. So we're going to use that as the uh, evidence of competence of the company. And uh, in order to become a BESA member, you actually have to go through a competence assessment standard that focuses on your technical capabilities. Can you do it? For an individual, we operate skill card, which is aligned to CSCS. Uh, and at the moment, it's a register of what are your uh, qualifications. But for uh, the future, we're looking to see how this can adopt the CPD requirements of Hackett. So that it becomes a register of your competence. So that you, for the company, it's from BESCA, uh, Competent Person Scheme. For the individual, it is uh, for the skill card. And Currently, BESCA is UCAS accredited, and we're looking at a way of trying to get skill card UCAS accredited, but that's a slightly more complicated, but that's one for the future. Uh, we have, so we have this focal, focus on technical competence. Um, we are members of Build UK, uh, and we very much support the initiatives they're following, and one of those is on the PQ system that they're bringing forward to allow a standardization of PQ across a, a range of um, companies and so we don't have to continuously answer questions in a slightly different way which has huge cost to the industry and adds very little value uh, but currently there are 249 questions i think the next iteration takes it over 300 but there's none on it that say can you do the job now we all know that actually the fact you cannot do a job in the construction industry has never stopped you winning a job but actually we think that is going to change. We believe the culture needs to change. 
And at that point, we want to be ahead of that and drive that. So we have a heavy, heavy focus on can you do the job? If you say you can strangle pipe work into a plant room, prove it. If you can, if you say you are a ductwork installer, then prove you can design, install, maintain clean ventilation ductwork. The same is true of air conditioning and the same is true of maintenance. If you're a maintenance contractor, evidence that you have and can do that properly. That will help a great deal with the golden thread because one of the requirements we think will be needed is that each contractor will need to have clear evidence of what they have done, what they have installed, and, and including photographic evidence of every single bit. So that in eight years, 10 years time, someone can't come back and say, look what you did, and you have no evidence to, to show that isn't how you left it. Um, if you want to sleep at night, that's probably a good thing for any contractor to do anyway. We don't actually agree with uh, Hackett's view that BIM will be the answer to the golden thread because there are too many um, difficulties around have we got the skills base to do that uh, and who's going to pay the software license and who's going to keep the model up to date. So we think there will be a number of intermediary products, one of which will incorporate things like SFG20, which is the maintenance standard we operate, that bridges between the AIM or the BIM into CAFM software. And we're dealing with a couple of major clients at the moment in order to ensure that, that that happens automatically, but in a standardized way. And one of the key areas that will come with that is to train maintenance people to be able to work in a regulated, consistent manner with the data they're dealing with. One of the other requirements of uh, Hacky will be near miss reporting. And we have, a, have an informal near miss reporting thing at the moment through our technical committee but we will be formalizing that to a greater degree uh, hopefully working with scoss who you're going to hear from later so finally a couple of things about why this is so important i talked about shell designs hollow designs so on average a building has about 20 percent of the design completed before we start on site that is bound to lead you to build and design i mean you cannot do dfma you cannot do off-site, you cannot do many of the things you wish to do because of that. 200%, I think as a result of the build and design, we end up using 200% more energy in an average building than the design intent, 200%, which is a staggering figure. The most shocking statistic of all, these processes kill our people. We have two suicides every day from people working in construction. So what you see is broken buildings. Graham described it as a broken system and broken people as a result of building of this building process that is broken. On the upside, we are the solution. 40% of carbon emissions come from the built environment. We have the solutions to help the climate crisis if we are allowed to do it. And that's all we are really talking about. The changes that we're describing should not frighten good companies. They should frighten the cowboys because actually you level the playing field. And finally, uh, 1990, 90% of people spent 90% of their time in a building. We ought to get it right because if we get it right, the social impact is massive. Both physical and mental health are improved massively by uh, the built environment that is good. If you want a smart city, you need to start with a smart building. So we are really looking forward to this new, more regulated environment because we think good buildings will thrive and you'll get better buildings as a result. So thank you very much. My apologies for my uh, ineptness on the uh, presentation front, but uh, over to you, Thomas. Great, well, thank you very much indeed, David. That's really good. Um, so I think we need to move swiftly on to our next presentation. Um, our next presenter is Julie Brugella, who is the Technical Director of Assurance at BRE Group. So um, over to you, Julie. Um, you've got slide control. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you can all see and hear me. Yes, does that work? Great. I can see your screen. Yeah, that's good. Super. 
Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to speak and hello to you all very much. Um, uh, appreciate um, the introductions both by Graham and David. Um, some of the themes will carry through, so um, looking forward to discussing that with all of you later. Just see whether I can get to the next slide. Perfect. Um, as part of my contribution um, to the discussion today, um, I actually wanted to introduce to you some learning and observations from the past, uh, specifically um, surrounding um, the use of large panel system buildings in the UK and the seminal event of Ronan Point, uh, which in my view really has lots of parallels and lessons, which I hope will bring some additional insight to the challenges we face now um, at the moment. I will give you a short introduction, a bit of background, um, and then hopefully uh, you will, like me, see some of those parallels. And um, I hope it allows us to look back in this current time where uh, changes afoot and outcomes um, are in the making and might be really instructing in forging some of the industry responses and actions going forward. So really, just a, a, a quick um, reminder to you all, LPS buildings, so large panel system buildings, as short for, really popular in the 1950s, and um, popular across the UK and across Europe, and really a shortage of homes, a lack of skilled labour that really led us to sort of go for system buildings, yeah, so buildings which were manufactured um, off-site or close to site to high quality and then assembled on-site. Also, they were modern in layout, they were light, and they had lots and lots of space. So high-rise living in urban areas, um, sort of combined with modernism in architecture entering the mainstream. Um, I have copied here um, just a, a, a short um, definition of modernism, which I'm not going to sort of go into, but what I wanted to bring out is what I've underlined here, um, which is really sort of embracing minimalism, of course, um, but really the analytical approach to the function of buildings and the rational use often of new materials and structural innovations. Um, and, and some key highlights, really, for me, that um, we, we face today, which is really the industry as a key to renewal. Just a very quick introduction to large panels, just so that you can follow um, the event that happened after. Usually comprised of a precast or precast concrete floor, some roof components spanning onto story height structural precast wall panels, and importantly, various forms of site made joints, um, which is sort of the, the, the very little bit of activity in connotation marks that was happening on site. It's the connectivity of the system, it's that very, very connectivity that was also the cause of the collapse at Ronan Point. And this is what I'm showing you here. So 1968, um, a gas explosion um, in this part of the building, um, uh, in the kitchen, then led to the progressive collapse of an entire corner of the building. This at the time, was a huge shock to the industry. Yeah, it, it was a, a, a huge failure, a failure which was later termed disproportionate to the originating cause. The parallels of this event, and importantly, the root cause analysis. Sorry, I'm trying to sort of switch between the various bits of my screen, which is why it is going back and forth a bit. Apologies for that. Um, really show the, the set, whatever happened next really shows um, the, the parallels in my view, but also the search for the root cause and the systemic change that followed. So after the event in 68, an inquiry was set up to look to the cause of the explosion and the subsequent progressive collapse and explore the structural design implications for existing and future blocks of this nature. Later on, Government, also in 1968, then um, issued instructions to appraise the structural design of existing and proposed LPS blocks and published circulars, something that will be familiar. And then also a program of assessment and strengthening of many existing blocks and modifications, 1968 after. And then in 1970, 
we saw the change of the UK building regulations to introduce the requirement, um, which we know now of approved document AA3, to minimise the risk of disproportionate damage. So where are we now? So we're 50 years on and we have really rediscovered um, large panel system bills. They seem to have exited um, our collective psyche up to this point and really we have rediscovered them through this increased inspection prompted also um, by Grenfell. We have found them, they are ageing structures, um, we found them as part of the service life reviews and we've also found that there are so many of them, significant costs for refurbishing them or replacing them and all of that um, against a really large stock. We've also found that we have had many different asset owners, multidisciplinary decision makers and through the time a real loss of asset knowledge. Loss of the knowledge of the fact that this was a specific asset in the first place that had very specific challenges, some work done to it, um, but also range of interventions either be it directly during or after the events but also we are facing a situation where there is very little records we also have what we would call a generational knowledge gap it's a different era and we're finding that there is really a gap between the understanding of this type of form but also as to the asset knowledge that we have at this point in time. And what we're also finding, uh, which I think is, is a real parallel, is, is sort of this sort of understanding about how do I apply regulation um, that has changed to an existing asset, what is its reach and applicability, and how do I implement? So this is my last slide, and I hope this will prompt our discussion um, uh, going forward um, after, after the presentations have completed. Um, for me, what really are our parallels in my mind is um, first of all the societal need that drives construction trends and the requirement for us as the, the industry to be alert and understanding but also learning from history and adapting it to the future. There's something about embedding regulatory change throughout the generations, um, the competence of its people and we also have real evidence um, through um, this learning from the large panel system build issue about forgetting lessons learned over time. Um, there is then also a real clear strand which I think is parallel as well which is around competence but the competence of people but also products and processes. Yeah, So exactly understanding this as the three P's as we sometimes call it. And then there's also this real question around the through life care requirements, the competence of the profession. And here again, the golden thread is, is, is a key phrase that, that so resonates also um, in this particular form of construction and is such a, a, a great lesson um, for us all going forward. There is also a real um, parallel around the competent asset owner and the need for multidisciplinary decision making through life, but also the ensuring of an anchor passing skill set as we do that. And the point that also David made previously, but again the importance of diligent recording and analysing of near misses, everything that we find in the built environment, to log it, to review it, to understand it, to exchange about what we're finding and to communicate it widely. Um, David mentioned a sort of a, a local scheme, but I hope all of you are familiar with uh, the confidential reporting on structural safety, the CROSS system. I've included a link here. Um, and again, with finding these, they, it keeps things on the radar and it also allows us to not forgetting lessons learned over time and to reappraise and relook at our product, our people and our processes. So this is it for me. I hope this has made up a bit of time and allows sufficient time for the remainder of the presentation. So thank you very much. Hope Great. Well, thank you, very, thank you very much, Julie. That was a um, really interesting presentation. Um, so um, without further ado, I would like to move on to our next speaker, who is um, Simon Lay who is the a director of OFR Consultants. I'd just like to take this opportunity to remain, remind the, the remaining speakers that we're a little bit tight for time. So um, if we could keep our presentations succinct, that'd be really appreciated. Thank you very much, Simon. Will do, Thomas. Uh, just check if you can hear me and see the screen. Shout up if you can't. 
Um, okay, uh, thanks so much, Thomas, for uh, uh, organising today. I'll I'll skip too much introduction, just to say uh, I'm a founder and director at OFR. We're an independent fire and jury consultancy. Um, we've got 75 staff across seven offices in the UK, um, and uh, I'm very pleased to be talking today. So, um, um, I just want to echo something that Judy uh, was talking about there, about how we got here. And I think it's really important to understand why we're having changes in regulations because if we don't understand those um, and people don't buy into why there is a need for a change in regulations then any amount of regulation is not going to change anything um, i developed this chart a couple of years ago actually straight after grenfell uh, happened and it's a chart of high-rise residential buildings being constructed in the uk and what you can see here is um, but basically we had a period of time for about 30 years where we basically didn't build anything um, of the high-rise residential type. At the same time, um, the orange line there is fire deaths, which were falling. So we kind of thought that things were getting safer. Um, we had a few buildings catch fire and critically, the one with the little circle around it, that was Grenfell Tower being built in 1974, um, right at the end actually of the uh, initial high-rise building peak. Um, and what I call this is, is a knowledge chasm. Um, there was a period of time where we didn't build anything um, of the type that, that uh, forms these in-scope higher risk residential buildings. Um, lots of societal reasons why we didn't do that, but um, it's very hard to understand where anybody who started building things in the sort of mid 2000s got their knowledge from. Um, that's quite a scary thought. Um, particularly when we started refurbishing buildings and a lot of people who thought that perhaps designing and building high-rise buildings was easy. Um, they look simple, they look easy, uh, we just design a floor plate, repeat it, jobs are good. And, um, but get anything wrong on that floor plate and you repeat it throughout the whole building. Um, if you don't understand that the critical thing about tall buildings is where they touch the ground, um, then you really know nothing about tall building design, frankly. And most tall buildings live or die in the ground. Uh, I think most structural engineers will tell you that, um, and probably most cost consultants as well. So we have this problem. Um, and the problem is that, as Judy just sort of explained, um, we developed a new building system back in the 60s, uh, or even late 50s, to, to build high-rise buildings in, in large panel form. And we didn't really understand what we were doing, and it led to catastrophe. Um, the same thing kind of happened uh, a few years ago when we started refurbishing tall buildings. Um, didn't perhaps fully understand, or some people didn't, the nature of the materials we were using and the risk we were introducing and the hazards being introduced. And we end up with a catastrophe. So the critical thing here is that any new regulatory system and the way it's applied has to make sure that it picks up what's changing in construction at the moment and doesn't allow that to happen again. And we are seeing a revolution in construction. We are seeing a revolution in off-site construction, in modular, in timber, in new materials, new uses of buildings, all these sorts of things changing. And any regulatory system has to be able to accommodate that. And those people working within it need to understand that as well. Um, of course, Grenfell Town is only part of the story. Um, anyone who remembers Carillion, um, will uh, remember that business went under with about, I think, a billion in debts and about half a billion in pension shortfall. But I think it was also had about 300 billion, sorry, 300 million set aside for um, claims, particularly relating to PFI. And um, a lot of people in construction knew there were issues with the construction sector, um, which had been brought to light, perhaps, by claims in the PFI sector, um, in particular, um, large hospital projects and the such like. And um, actually, I think um, a lot of people in the construction industry were already changing to accommodate that. Um, very briefly, um, what buildings are in scope of the new regulations at the first pass anyway. Um, curiously, it's uh, uh, anything over six storeys um, or anything 18 metres and above. So you can have some situations coming up where uh, you might have buildings with fewer people in them, um, but very close to 18 metres that are out of scope, which there's a whole debate about whether that's right or not. And actually the government is in the process of still reviewing the trigger heights for guidance and future legislation. There's a government contract that's just been put out to tender looking at specifically that particular topic. Um, 
It's also worth noting that the current rules are talking about multi-occupied residential buildings, um, but there's a, a big debate perhaps around whether we should be including other building types in the higher risk category as well. Um, I've always found it a bit of an anomaly the way that hotels have been excluded from recent changes, for example. Um, and I think we will see other changes coming out of the current research that's ongoing. So I wouldn't expect this to just apply to residential buildings for long, particularly given the implementation period for the legislation. Um, this is kind of how things used to look um, from sort of planning through construction, occupancy and design and maintenance. You had lots of different people sort of looking after the regulations, um, planning departments, which of course part of the local authority, building control, fire service, um, builder control perhaps coming back in at the end, depending on some maintenance works, the fire service having a bit of an input at planning, but not really much of one and, and, and the such like. Lots of people, lots of interfaces. And whenever you have interfaces in uh, any kind of design process, if somebody isn't integrating across those interfaces, then you end up with problems um, and you end up with, with gaps forming. And that seems to be what's happened. So one of the key principles of the building safety regulator is that they will have regulatory powers over all these stages, although it'll be interesting to see how it works in practice because we haven't got long to put in place new procedures and new methodologies or indeed new people. So uh, it seems likely a lot of the people you deal with day to day will be the same people you deal with now, but under a slightly different higher level regulator. Exactly how that works, whether that actually has the teeth it needs to have is something that needs to be really thought through. Um, so moving on to actual supply chain issues, so I'm going to talk mainly about sort of the uh, uh, design and, and pre-construction sort of stage side of things. And I think David Stowe is going to talk a bit more about products and the such like. So um, I think every presenter has mentioned the word competency. Um, if we work in a building regulation process like we have in the UK, then competency is king. The entire process is dependent upon competency and those competent people caring, by the way, as well. And competency needs to be considered at the individual level, it needs to be considered at the corporate level, and it needs to be considered at a project specific level. There is no point saying, I've hired this company because they've done this sort of work before, if the person they give you to do the project hasn't got the relevant experience. And there's no point hiring this company because we've done the work before, or we think they've done that sort of project somewhere else, well, it isn't the same type of project. There's no point saying, oh, they've done, I don't know, a high-rise office building, they must be good at doing high-rise residential buildings as well. We need to start digging deeper into people's experience and actually challenging whether those people are gonna be delivering projects. I suggested that it's very important we use chartered engineers and professional people, um, not necessarily because it's a huge badge of competency. It, it, it's the best measure we have perhaps at the moment, but also it comes with jeopardy. Um, and chartered engineers do face some jeopardy if they um, do not abide by the rules of their profession. Um, I'm going to disagree with David here slightly. Um, I think we've got time and I think we're all going to have to become BIM competent in a way that a lot of building professionals or designers simply haven't bothered to be. Um, I think it is going to become critical. I think we're going to be dragged kicking and screaming into that. And I know we're investing um, huge amounts of time and effort in that particular area. And um, there was also mentioned um, earlier by Graham, I think that liability is going to be a big question. Can people keep up with the liability um, questions? We're already seeing this happening with architects saying that they're not able to take any liability, for example, for fire safety design because their insurers won't let them, um, which introduces some quite interesting challenges. Um, I think as part of that, we'll also start to see people's scope changing significantly. So you need to find building design professionals who are willing to be engaged in the process that take responsibility for their designs, that are willing to work on a project from start to finish. Um, I come from a, a process industry background and I used to be a commissioning engineer, so I know what it's like to have to build things that other people have designed. You really need building professionals who are willing to design stuff they're gonna be around for when it's being built. Um, we need to make sure there's no design gaps. We have a nasty tendency for designing things on the cheap and leaving stuff for contractors to sort out with their subcontractors later on. That needs to come to an end. Um, and you need people who are proactive and challenge in the design process. Um, approval supply chain is gonna start changing. Um, uh, it was mentioned that the future building regulation, um, uh, building control has, has just been published, that was published yesterday. Well, 
We're starting to see um, a focus on competency at an individual level about carving out building control as a career path. Um, we need to make sure we've got capacity for those people to engage. I know there's, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion going on about how we get that capacity in the system. You need to make sure that building control authorities are willing to challenge. Um, we hear a lot of people saying, and it's been said recently at the Grenfell Inquiry, well, building control didn't feel that they could challenge because um, they were bound by the regulations. Well, you need people who are willing to stand up and challenge things. Um, and we also need to see partnering for complex specialisms. As the building regulations, or uh, sorry, as building construction continues to evolve, we tend to get more specialisms and more specialist design, and we need to make sure that those approval parties are reaching out and uh, seeking people who are going to do proper review work for them in some very complex areas as they emerge. Um, final slide here, uh, talking a bit about delivery. Um, on the left there, there's a pretty sort of typical uh, section through uh, uh, an external facade. Uh, you've got the external cladding, you've got a window, you've got an internal um, wall part of the external wall, and you've got the internal linings. I've only highlighted four different packages there. Um, I've seen schemes where that's been split into five or six different subcontractors. Um, too many splits. Um, if we're going to start maintaining a golden thread, we need to start bringing packages back together again. And I know that's very difficult from a commercial perspective, and it's been a key commercial factor for some contractors, but we need to make sure that if you do split packages, that there is proper integration across those packages. Too many times you pick up drawings in O&M manuals that say, buy others, um, or similar, and the such like, and you just have people closed down, taking responsibility for their little bit of design, but not looking over the fence at what other people are doing. That can't continue. Um, and I know for the last couple of years, we've been really forcing contractors to bring together their design teams and their subcontractors to get, for example, on facades and external walls, one drawing that shows everything that everyone signed up to. Um, and you know, it's not that difficult to do, but it is um, something which we've become perhaps not used to doing because of liabilities and the such like. Um, and I think finally, certification and insurance are going to become very, very important. It was um, sort of touched upon, I think, by David, but we need to be really careful to make sure that when people are offering certification, that it's valid, um, that they are um, offering certification in the right way and it doesn't have to be caveats in it. We need to make sure that subcontractors are using certification processes that are validated. Um, and we need to just have some oversight and assurance on that. And that's already happening in the industry, I'm pleased to say. So I think has been has been suggested already, you know, the good competent people in the industry, they're already changing. They've had some big financial incentive to change. Um, and I think we have seen some cultural change at the top. Um, the question is whether the medium sized and um, the smaller contractors and any cowboys hopefully driven out by this can also um, uh, adapt to the, the these new regimes. OK, that's uh, that's me done. Great. Well, th 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 thanks very much, Simon. Um, so um, we're moving s swiftly on to our next presenter. Um, our next presenter is um, John Miller, who is a partner of Fennec Elliott. I've, um, you've now got um, um, screen control. So um, if you're ready to go, thank you very much. Tom, thank you very much for that. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. Yep. Hope you're going to tell me that. Very, very briefly, I realize we're short for time. My name's John Miller, I'm a solicitor and a partner of a firm called Fennec Elliott. Um, this could be a very short talk because I'm going to just cover two quite short topics, which is basically the existing regime looking back where people have tried to litigate or sue. We all know there are defective buildings out there, problems with the building envelope, etc. But where so it should be quite an easy way to sue when we cover compensation. But the two cases that have reached the court have both failed. Uh, the claiming parties have been unsuccessful. And then looking just very briefly on the effect of COVID on building regulations. And the truth is, is that the government's been very clear. Building regulation, the regime, the regime, the assessment regime should all continue. So there shouldn't be a problem and inspections can be carried out remotely. So there shouldn't be any issues with those at all. Now, uh, just with the first of those topics, we've had two cases looking at the existing law, or could I say the pre-Grenfell law, where people have tried to seek compensation. One uh, is in relation to a development called cityscape in Croydon, where essentially 
there was a 95 apart 95 apartment block building where it was found that the cladding was defective and there was a claim for 2.4 million pounds where the building manager tried to pass that on to the tenants uh, i'd be a little bit careful what i say here because i was involved in initial aspects of that case um, the tenant said there is no way they should pay a service charge of 2.4 million. Uh, the reason being is they're saying that that was money to correct defects in the original design and the original construction in the building envelope. However, the tribunal held there that they had to pay. Uh, they all had 999 year leases and the freeholder, the landowner, had very little interest in the building and in the terms of the lease they had to pay. The tribunal also said that the tenants may try and find compensation from the original builder, from the designer, but they recognised that would be extremely difficult, and that's putting it politely. The second case on screen is the Heron Court case, where um, the lessees and management company of a particular development actually went after the building inspector. Uh, the estimated costs of remedying the building envelope there, I think, were three million pounds. And what they use, they use the Defective Premises Act. And the Defective Premises Act covers most people listening to this seminar uh, in the sense of if you carry out work in connection with a dwelling, you have a duty to use reasonable skill and care to make sure that that dwelling is fit for human habitation. You owe that duty whether or not you have a contract. And this is why the building inspector was sued under the Defective Premises Act because he didn't have a contract with the lessees. Now, it was held there that the Defective Premises Act didn't apply to building inspectors. And to quote the court, the building inspectors have an essential function which is not to contribute in any meaningful way to the design or construction of a building. So the act did not apply. It applied to subcontractors, builders, designers, but not building inspectors. But the truth is, is that most people expected Quite a bit of litigation to follow Grenfell, and we are seeing that. For what it's worth, and it's not a boast, um, I have around about 150 cases dealing with the building envelope at the moment. Um, but most people are adjudicating or pursuing the original designer or the original builder. Now, I said this talk should be quite short, and it, and it is quite easy, really. The, the clear government advice is that COVID should have no impact on the building regulations whatsoever. This is why we have the raging for the building safety regulation regulator, which is being set up. Uh, one query, which I suspect is for another panelist, is that the building safety regulation regime, regime will come under the HSE. And the HSE has used the intervention fee to fund itself. I'm told anecdotally that that's not producing as much money as was envisaged. So query again, how the building safety regulator Will be, will be funded. It's been very clear throughout the COVID um, lockdown that waking watches should continue. They, they were designated as key workers under the government guidelines. Similarly, Nightingale hospitals, their construction, there, there was a diktat to local authorities saying that they should take a pragmatic approach to building regulations, bearing in mind the pressure that builders spent felt under to get these Nightingale hospitals up and running. But even then, it was very clearly stated by the government, the local authorities, much be pragmatic, should not weaken any regulation which protects health and safety. Um, also, the government made it very clear that remedial works to the building envelope to cladding, which was already underway, should continue come what may. It was described as an essential service and some of the people out there may have seen the pledge that was signed by the Minister for Housing and around about 20 local authority leaders, including the Mayor of Liverpool, uh, saying that they intended to carry on and to help and to make sure remedial works to the building envelope were going to continue throughout the whole of the uh, COVID-19 lockdown. Um, the real issue is, is this. Um, the government has said that building inspections under the current lockdown and previously under the more harsher lockdown should continue. There is no reason why buildings should not be assessed and inspections should carry on or should have carried on 
provided they're done safely. And that's one of the, I, I like many people, I may be suffering a bit of guidance fatigue at the moment, but the guidance was very, very strong times that building inspections should continue, provided they could be done safely. Now, in the same government guidance, it was said that inspections could possibly done, be done remotely. They could be videoed. The building, the building inspector had to look at whether he actually needed to go to site. Could did the site comply with social distancing rules? So also in the same rule and regulation, the government indicated that an inspector should not just rely on a remote inspection. He shouldn't just rely on a video. And I've seen commentary saying that inspectors should use drones. So my point there is that if we really are having a building inspection regime at the moment, which is relying on videos, photographs, or what have you, how reliable are they? I'm not aware of any real building inspection that's taken place via a drone, via video, but I think we need to take into account, which I think Dame Hackett said, of people marking their own homework. There is an issue that the building inspector does need to look, how often does he need to look, or she need to look, and how often do they have problems? Is it a valid reason for them not to inspect if certain building sites are not complying with social distancing rules? Um, query whether a building inspection can be done under the latest SOP version five. I see no reason why it can't be if people are working on a building site. Um, Desktop studies will still be relevant. And I know I shouldn't really use the phrase desktop studies, but that can be done, the background work, without visiting site, checking inspections, checking drawings. But overall, building inspections and the whole regime should continue. Um, I realize that we're slightly, oh, sorry, I realize that we're slightly short for time. Um, but if I could just conclude on this in a sense of, just to wrap this up, first of all, the current rules, regulations pre-Grenfell, uh, there have been some court cases, but they offer very little guidance because essentially, for various reasons, largely legal, the claimants have failed. They've not been able to obtain compensation, even though everybody knows what the real issue is with the building envelope and the defects that people are uncovering almost daily. And secondly, um, there's no reason for COVID should prevent a building inspection, building assessments, or what have you. I query to what extent this can be done remotely, bearing in mind that the, all the problems we had with building inspections not being carried out as they should have been prior to Grenfell. Tom, welcome any uh, questions at the end of this, but back to you. Very well. Um, thanks very much, John. Um, that was great. Um, we're now going to move on to our final speaker. Um, who is David Stowe, Associate Director of Fire Engineering at Arup. Um, you should have screen control now. Excellent. Thank you. I can see your screen. Great. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Stowe. I work for Arup. Um, and if you don't know, we're an independent firm of designers, planners, engineers, architects, and technical specialists. Um, but I've been a fire engineer for over 20 years now, and, and over that time, I've seen a huge amount of change in how fire safety has dealt with in the construction industry, uh, but probably none more so in the last three years since the tragic events at Grenfell Tower laid bare the systemic failings that Dame Judith Hackett subsequently identified. So the, the theme for today's webinar is risk and regulation in 2020. What does it mean for the supply chain? I'm just going to talk briefly about my experience as a fire engineer, um, working as part of that supply chain on projects. Um, and particularly, I'm going to focus on uh, products and materials and the evidence needed from the supply chain to demonstrate compliance with building regs. Um, the increased level of scrutiny that's being placed on that evidence as more and more people need to verify the evidence for themselves. And just look at some of the areas where that the evidence from the supply chain um, can fall short and what we can do about it. Um, 
So I think everyone's hopefully you know familiar with the Hackett review that was issued over two years ago now, um, and you know the systemic failings that um, Dame Judith Hackett identified, um, and it raised real concerns about competence, the regulations, um, the guidance, the weak and complex process for um, for demonstrating compliance of, of buildings and their constituent parts. Um, and since that time, you know, I think as Graham set out very, very clearly at the start of this um, this webinar, you know, a huge amount of work has been undertaken by the industry to to try and address some of those those, those concerns, you know, and, and that work will go on for a number of years now, I'm sure. But you know, what what do we mean by fire safety compliance? Well, it's made up of a number of different parts. You know, firstly, the design and specification. Uh, created by the design team has to be compliant, has to meet the functional requirements of the building regs, either following a prescriptive route or an alternative route. Oh, sorry, bit trigger happy there. Uh, next, the product selection by trade contractors has to be compliant. The, you know, the products that are put forward by the trades has to have the right level of evidence sitting behind it, the right test evidence primarily sitting behind it to demonstrate compliance. Then when it gets to site and, and, and it is installed, the subcontractors need to demonstrate that it's been installed in a compliant way. Has it been installed in the way that it's been tested? And finally, the information handed over to the building operator at the end of all of that um, has to be compliant as well. Has to comprehensively describe all of those steps I've just talked about. And the evidence has to be collated and handed over digitally in order to satisfy Regulation 38 and, of course, the golden thread. And in terms of uh, materials and products, you know, the hierarchy set out in approved document B to demonstrate compliance is, is, is pretty clear. You know, that if you have a test standard available for a material or product, um, then, then you should you should undertake testing for that. But it's recognized that you can't always test um, all, all different combinations of, of product parameters. So it is, um, it is possible to undertake assessments of, of, um, of products to determine whether they can, they're can they capable of meeting the required level of performance. So in some cases, there's an extended field of application standard that you can follow. Um, in other cases where there isn't an XAP standard, it might be possible to undertake a technical assessment. Um, but the important thing is that technical assessment has to follow a uh, recognized methodology. And, and you know, approved document B is, is very clear that assessment should only be um, undertaken where there is sufficient relevant test evidence available an assessment shouldn't be regarded as a way to avoid a test where one is necessary. Um, and I think the important thing for me is that the evidence provided by the supply chain on the compliance of what they're putting forward um, has to be, well, firstly, it has to be made available, it has to be relevant, and it has to be transparent. You know, that evidence can't be based on their opinion, their experience, or assumptions that they're making. So, you know, how is the supply chain responding or how has it responded over the last few years? Um, well, from my experience and going back to what Dame Judith Hackett found, I think it's certainly still patchy. You know, from, from in my role as a fire engineer working in the design and the construction stage of projects, we're still finding materials and products continually being put forward, submitted by the trades without the right level of supporting evidence to demonstrate compliance with the building regs. You know, and in the last, in the two weeks that I was, you know, since I was asked to join this webinar, uh, I've seen examples of fire resisting and smoke extract duct work being put forward uh, for use outside the bounds of of um, of what how it was tested, either due to size, shape, orientation, or insulation. Cavity barriers and fire stopping um, being installed in the, the the horizontal orientation, but with test evidence provided for uh, the vertical orientation. You know, which is a very different um, type of fire exposure. Uh, large facade brackets being clamped to intumescent protected steelwork and relying on the paint supplier's opinion as to whether it will be okay or not. Um, fire resisting boards that are normally used to provide structural fire protection to structural elements being used to protect service penetrations. You know, it's a completely different application. Uh, and as I say, that's just in the last two weeks when uh, since I was asked to join this webinar. And I think, you know, what, so why is this happening? I think part of the reason why um, the supply chain is sort of struggling to provide the evidence needed for compliance is that since the Hackett Review and all the subsequent changes that we've been talking about in the industry, there's been a much greater level of scrutiny placed on the information um, that they're submitting. 
and there's a greater number of parties now scrutinizing that information. You know, I think what previously would have been disseminated to multiple parts of the design team without any one party taking um, responsibility for that. Um, and, and the parties might not be competent to take responsibility for that. Or might have been agreed with building control. Um, and that agreement was taken as, as proof of compliance. Or, you know, products or materials might have been justified on the basis that, well, this is how we've always done it. You know, so it must be right. And why are you asking me so many questions? You know, those approaches are, are clearly no longer acceptable. And I think as a result, the supply chain is struggling to keep up. But things have changed. You know, in the last three years, in my experience, there's been um, a marked change in the number of clients recognizing their own corporate responsibility in the process of delivering uh, uh, safe buildings and changing how they approach fire safety. So, for example, you know, clients developing their own corporate fire safety standards with explicit requirements set out for, 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 for what needs to be achieved from the design from a fire safety perspective, you know, and going beyond the minimum requirements of the building regs. Or clients putting in place building contracts that specify the standard of fire safety needed and the, the amount of evidence needed to demonstrate that, you know, so a much bigger paper trail now being needed. You know, and I think because of this and uh, kind of agreeing with what Simon said earlier, um, we've seen a significant expansion in our scope as fire engineers um, on projects that we're now regularly appointed through the construction stage to either work for the, for, the, for the contractor to help them implement the fire safety design and ensure that the integrity of the fire safety design isn't watered down um, or appointed by the client to undertake a monitoring role to again, just oversee what the contractor is doing and making sure that the integrity of the fire safety strategy is maintained throughout construction. Um, you know, because it, it's it is a very difficult transition to go from detailed design inf information to detailed construction information to then implementation on site. And I think as Simon said in his presentation, anytime you get transitions like that and interfaces like that, you get gaps. You know, and uh, you know, it's, it's great to see clients are changing and recognizing that and the need to have um, you know, a consistent party going all the way through um, the design, the construction and the handover phases. You know, and that's a, that's a service that we've been providing out for a number of years. Um, and for my discipline, I, you know, I think that's really the, the essence of the golden thread. So, you know, I think we are, we're certainly in a period, it feels to me like a period of adjustment and all parts of the supply chain have to become more skilled in fire safety, um, in understanding and scrutinizing test and classification evidence and the whole, the whole supply chain working together to deliver safe buildings. Compliance with the building regs has to be evidence-based and not, as I said earlier, based on opinion, experience or assumption. Um, and just because suppliers are willing to accept the liability for how their product or system is used, that doesn't mean that that product or system delivers the level of safety needed. You know, the golden thread seeks to extend good fire safety practice throughout all stages of a building's life cycle, and it has to therefore extend beyond just fire safety professionals. The full supply chain, in my view, has to be brought into this to achieve the comprehensive level of evidence-based transparent information to prove that our buildings are safe, but most of all, to make people feel like they're safe in the buildings that they're occupying. You know, I, I feel like we've, I do feel like we've come a long way and a lot of change is happening. Um, and, you know, we are moving away from this culture of indifference. Um, but in the supply chain, I still, I, I feel like that does still exist to a large extent. You know, people just want to deliver buildings quickly uh, with the least amount of hassle. Um, but clearly that doesn't deliver safe buildings all the time, you know, and I think I'm passionate, you know, I passionately believe that we need to get to a point where we can say how proud we are of the level of fire safety that our buildings achieve. Thank you. Great, well, thanks very much, David, um, for your presentation. Um, if I can invite the other um, speakers to um, come back on screen now with your your cameras and microphones on, and we we should have um, we've got we've got a few minutes to take a um, couple of questions. So it, it, to anyone who's listening, if you want to submit your 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 questions now, that'd be good. Um, so first question really is, well, you made an interesting point, Simon, 
about that window, that picture of that wall section with the window in, in the canary is very instructive. You had, I think, four packages just on one small area of the building. It was mm -hmm. quite, very interesting. And uh, thinking about all the complexities of getting it right, communicating information, the golden thread, and competence. Would it just not be better if, this, if we went back to the old days when contractors actually employed people rather than subcontracting everything? And so, sort of, you know, took more responsibility. There's more more responsibility focused into fewer hands. Would, would would that be a good thing? Um, I don't know whether you want to answer that, Simon. Anyone else wants to come in? <laughs> uh, I'll have a, I'll have a go at answering it. Um, I I think there's a lot to be said for the old ways, as as as, as you might say. Um, and, and my career is long enough to to remember sort of the days before sort of perhaps project managers ran projects and and it was all about building stuff. Um. But I think at the same time, um, there's a huge amount of specialism that's going on. And we have to think of buildings not as um, a, a built structure in, in the same way you might think of a house, for example, but particularly taller buildings, they are um, a, a series of complicated systems. Um, I, I, I read a very interesting book um, last year all about the Apollo program, about how they put together rockets. And, and it made me realize how much of what we do in the building industry actually related to that. And we have to think of things like facades and um, other systems within the building as, as systems. And then you need to make sure that people are integrating across those systems properly. Um, and as, as I and, and David said, you know, the more interfaces you have, the more places there are for gaps to occur. Um, and getting buildings right is all about crossing over those gaps and getting, getting those gaps to disappear. Um, you know, and, and that's the real challenge. And once you start realizing that more gaps is more problems, then you do start to ask yourself, well, maybe I should eliminate some of those gaps. Um, and perhaps that will change uh, the, the, the way the contractors look at things. But if you don't eliminate the gaps, then the, the fallback to that is to have a matrix type approach where you have people properly looking across the project. And that's kind of what fire engineers do. You know, we're, we're, we're not specialists in, um, uh, structures or or plant or facades or anything like that we are we, we look at the building with a, with a filter with with a, with a pair of glasses on that just sees fire issues but actually it's often a very good way of, of looking across multiple systems um, and multiple challenges um, and uh, to, to, to help sort of solve some of those issues so I think we have a different way of looking at projects perhaps which is quite useful um, so we don't feel scared about that but I think that there's a, a lot more cross system um, integration that's required and needs to be brought up to speed. Great, thank you. Um, sort of again, going back to the whole issue around um, fragmentation. Um, um, David Fries, you made you made the point about BIM, and you, you said you didn't think BIM was the right answer. And, and I think I know. I think Simon sort of came back and sort of rather countered that later on. But um, I mean, David, if I mean everyone's sort of saying BIM is the future. If it's not BIM. What would you propose? What, what, what would be the way, the method, the tool that people could all use and communicate? You have a clear audit trail. Um, so, you know, John has a legal case in 10 years' time. You can see exactly who said what and when. What would that look like? Uh, in the first, first point from Simon is I would agree with Simon entirely about products. We should consider the building as a product instead of a series of products because if you decide it's a product then you build holistic integrated systems. Uh, I didn't, if I said BIM isn't the answer, I think it's not quite the answer at the moment because I don't think the skill set is there to be able to deal with it. So there's an interim solution. Ultimately, and with things like the digital twin program, I think we will get there and it will just happen. But at the moment, if you start to bring data over from BIM into Catherine, you end up with loads of errors because we haven't actually established yet a common data environment or a common language to allow that to happen. So there needs to be an interim stage is what I'm saying. BIM is the answer, but we're not ready for it yet. And therefore there needs to be an interim stage. And I think many of Many SMEs and members are actually doing BIM without realising it because they're using tools that integrate, but are not quite, if you call it BIM, they, they'd scare them to death. But as you don't, they can use it. Okay. Anyone else like to comment on um, the BIM question? I think I would, I would concur with Simon. You know, the, you know, we're investing heavily in BIM, um, and we see that as as the most obvious tool to meet the golden thread. 
you know it's it's the, the you know it's the single source of truth that everyone is you know talking about and looking for um so i think it, it's it does require buy-in from everyone though doesn't it you know to have a single source of truth requires everyone to contribute to it um so yeah it's good to good to hear david um you agreeing that that you know that hopefully is the future um i take your point about you know the interim what happens in this interim stage though fully understand that i think we've got we've got a long way to go with perhaps some of the product suppliers to start producing information in the consistent format and we need to dig into the BIM standard. We know that gets complicated because there are ISO standards and, and there's there's lots of issues around exactly how you do that. But there is there's certainly challenges about getting particularly fire safety information into, into BIM because the, the relevant sort of families and classes aren't necessarily properly defined. So, you know, we need to work out how to do that because if we don't, in a couple of years' time, it will just be a complete mess with, with you know, different system running. So that's a key thing that needs to be solved. Thanks. Um, we've got a question here which actually applies to two of our speakers um, and given the fire engineers and given the, the fact that you seem to be getting a lot more inquiries, um, are there enough fire engineers um, to be able to cope with all this increased demand? <laughs> I, I, I would say absolutely not. Um, I mean we, we, we took it a couple of years ago, um, you know, we, we can't hire enough fire engineers um, Certainly not enough fire engineers that, that, can, that can work the way we want to work. So we, we, we just need to step up and, and breed them. You know, um, we, we are having to, um, we, we, we're searching out other disciplines. We're looking across other graduates and, and engineering and STEM to see people who can come into the profession um, and then putting in place, um, you know, good training schemes to, to, to bring them on board and, and to improve that competency because that's what we've got to do. Um, you know, there isn't enough fire engineers. There's not even properly good definition of what a fire engineer is and the competency of that and I know there's some discussions taking place tomorrow at the IFE that we're contributing to looking at how we can you know fit into that sort of bar raising side of things and and make sure that it's being done properly um, because it, it is a, a difficult profession um, in terms of finding people um, but you know I'll encourage anyone out there it's a really good profession it's interesting it's fun you get to work across everything um, and upset everybody it's great you know <laughs> can I just add a, a point to Graham, Graham here you can't see me um, the, a big part of the work of the PMO on the ACM remediation program from the MHCLG is all about um, capacity and the two biggest pinch points by a very long way are fire engineers and clerks of works um, and there are there are some um, things being done to try to plug the gap I mean with clerks of works is a bit easier than fire engineers because there are people probably losing their jobs right now in construction management for example who would have transferable skills and could be turned into clerks of works relatively quickly so that that, that works going on actually fire engineering is a much more difficult um, uh, issue and the number of the number of members of the institution of fire engineers who are chartered and capable of dealing with high-rise, high-risk buildings is actually very few. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so moving on now to another question, um, which will probably resonate with quite a few of you. Um, the question the question is asking: Do you think the um, New, the new building safety bill and requirements or mean big changes on, on the procurement side and they specifically mentioned design and build con contracts um, I know that people a lot of, a lot of people think design and build contracts are not helpful when it comes to um, building quality I wonder what the, any of the panel thought about that any, anyone like to take that John maybe is a lawyer um. I see, well, design and build, I think, is here to stay. Um, and I think uh, I'm old enough to realize that there are various fashions in building procurement, uh, construction management in the 80s, uh, trade contracting and what have you. Uh, to me, uh, the, 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 there's two things that will change things. One is the blunt instrument of the law. Uh, that can change people's behavior. And the other thing is clients, money. If, Except that the, 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 this will cost more, and then behaviour will change. Um, and, and there's no point, in my view, to talk about procurement 
if on a building site there's a mad scramble to get a job done, do it quickly and make sure you can't do a price that's far too competitive. I, 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 think, I think one of the things we will see is the design and build will probably stay, but I think we'll see the contractor continuing to move further upstream um, because if you're going to manage the supply chain to deliver all the golden thread information, um, then it's, it's more and more important that some of that information starts being embedded earlier on and therefore contractors with secured supply chains that they know can meet the information requirements they want, um, bringing them in earlier and earlier starts to, to happen more and more, I think. You know, I, I agree with that. I mean, we're, we're working with a lot of big contractors and, you know, the, I, I kind of hear what you said earlier, Simon, about kind of the, some of the smaller cowboys, but certainly the big contractors, in my experience, you know, are very, you know, attuned to fire safety and, you know, um, are stepping up to the mark, I think, you know, and are really um, taking their responsibilities seriously, you know, and, and setting a sometimes really challenging scope of works for fire engineers and others to help them deliver buildings, you know, and a lot of the things that we're being asked to do are stuff that we would never have been asked to do in the past, you know, re you know reviewing every single item that has a vague um, relevance to fire safety, you know, and sometimes we have to try and rein the contractor back in a bit and say, look, hold on a minute, we're not, you know, we can do this, but we're not the best people to do this. But I think, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever the, you know, whether it's DMB or, you know, a different contractual arrangement, I, you know, I think contractors are taking their responsibilities seriously because ultimately they see at the end of the day, they carry the can, you know, in a, in a lot of these cases. Um, so that's, that is, you know, there are some, definitely some green shoots out there. Thank you. Um, we're rather overrun on time. So I need to um, just ask one more question uh, before we um, can finish. So um, the question is asking, is it time to make building control a government department? This will con create consistency and give the service a status. After all, there's no competition for the police. So is it, well, what do you think of that? Do you think that would be a good thing to have a whole dedicated, directly funded building control regime? Well, can I answer that first? We, we, we sure. are moving. We are moving a little bit in that direction, aren't we? Because the, build, the building safety regulator will be a government department, will be part of the health and safety executive, which is an agency of the Department of Works and Pensions. And I suspect that over time, the responsibilities of the BSR will grow. It will become responsible for more and more types of building if the new regime is successful. Um, at the, you know, the, uh, in the implementation of the legislation as we think it's likely to be, it will be aided and assisted by building control, both in the public and private sectors. But I mean, we're moving inexorably, I think, towards a more regu centrally regulated um, set of, uh, you know, for buildings which are higher risk, however you determine that. Thank you, Graham. It's a very good point, actually. Um, so on that note, uh, I would like to say that really ends today's um, webinar. And I'd like to say thanks very much to all our presenters um, for their time, um, for their very interesting presentations, and also to our sponsors for making today's event possible. Um, we are actually going to have another um, webinar in this series on risk and regulations, which is on the 30th of September. So if you're interested in that, please put, your, put it in your diaries, and there will be further details in due course on the building website. Um, and for anybody who came in late today or wants to see um, the um, webinar again today, it will be available to download um, probably tomorrow now. But um, yeah, please, please do take a look at that. And um, thanks everyone for listening.